Okay, so the next presentation is the value and limitations of serological assays for the diagnosis of crypto infections, including tick-borne infections, includes points on how laboratory practices and policies create obstacles. And this presentation is by uh, Michael Cook. He's an independent researcher on tick-borne diseases since receiving a Lyme borreliosis diagnosis in 2009. It's an honor to be invited to speak at this uh, uh, conference. Um, we're going to be hearing from a lot of major uh, uh, figures, uh, important figures in the world of uh, tick-borne disease and specifically uh, borreliosis. And I'm going to look forward to uh, meeting them and listening to them later on. Uh, yeah, my degree's in physics and, uh, and uh, maths. Uh, my career was in the semiconductor industry, computer chip industry in the UK and uh, USA, uh, and research and development and engineering. Uh, I contracted uh, Lyme disease somewhere probably in the mid-2005 time after retiring to the south coast of England. Um, these are the publications that uh, I've worked on. Um, the original one was to um, knock down the crazy theory that it takes 24 or 48 or 36 hours of attachment time for a tick to transmit the disease. Uh, my paper demonstrates that the minimum attachment, the minimum time of attachment is totally unknown uh, and it can take place quite quickly, uh, uh, probably because some ticks are systemically infected. The theory that the, that the disease has to move from the, the bacteria have to move from the midgut of the tick to the salivary gland and then into the uh, uh, host, um, uh, that, that's not right. Uh, the other three papers on uh, testing, and uh, a recent paper that's just been published with uh, Dr. Lambert, uh, Ian Ross uh, Godana and Sinhan Lee in America worked to investigate the species of ticks in Ireland specifically, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, Lyme disease caused, probably everybody knows that uh, it was named uh, after Willy Bergdorfer identified the cause of, uh, of um, Lyme arthritis, Lyme disease in the, in the New England area um, in about 1981 and published, uh, it was named in 1984. Borrelia is a di diverse group of bacteria. There are 51 named species uh, in that group uh, divided historically into relapsing fever group and Lyme borreliosis group. Um, the first one, uh, Recurrentis, in, uh, uh, in uh, 1876, I think it was, uh, was the first one. It's the only one that's not a uh, tick-borne uh, disease. Uh, all these others are in uh, the blue triangles are the relaps categorized as relapsing fever. Um, there is one named uh, oral spirochete. Um, here is the Borrelia burgdorferi, and then uh, there's now a mixture of uh, those classified as Lyme Borrelia and those classified as relapsing fever. Uh, Miyamotoi was, has been classified into the uh, relapsing fever group, and I believe this is just part of the campaign to, to uh, minimize uh, and deny uh, Lyme disease. I'll come on to that a bit more later. There are 21 named species of Borrelia that are classified in the human, uh, in, in the uh, Lyme Borreliosis group. There's evidence, oh, excuse me, there's, there's evidence of uh, pathogenicity in um, nine of them. And the references for that uh, are here. And you will see, sorry, the, could you make the, uh, the LEDs? Um, and you, you will see um, Dr. Rydenko, who will be presenting later today, has, has participated and contributed to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the knowledge of these pathogenicity. Um, this, is the, this is from the study that was published recently. Um, ticks were sampled uh, in various parts of uh, Ireland. These are the locations ticks were, ticks were taken. Um, and these are the species that were found, Valesiana, uh, Gurenii, Mimotoi, and uh, other species that were not, uh, other uh, bacteria that were not speciated. Um, 
Uh, and it's important to know the species, uh, not necessarily because of treatment, but to uh, know whether the uh, tests are suitable to detect them. So Borrelia Borrelia, they've been around for uh, certainly over 20, uh, 20 million years, uh, detected in ticks in amber, um, probably a million years in our ancestors. Uh, uh, there's been, um, you can see from that chart, there's been a new species identified and named every two to three years since 1876. And so how many more are coming up tomorrow and the day after? Uh, relapsing fever division and, uh, and uh, Lyme disease uh, uh, groups is, is an historic division. These buttons are so close, my I've got a thumb problem, big thumb. Um, and they've over, evolved over time and adapted to different hosts and different vectors, but they form a continuum of uh, genetic variation. Uh, in, in fact, there's been a paper recently published uh, where they suggest there's ine inadequate evidence to support the division of the genus. Um, I haven't, I have, I'm not showing it today, but I've done analysis of the phylogenetic trees of uh, many of the Borrelia that have been published. And in, in fact, there's no clear division of the, of the trees. Uh, they actually intermix uh, within, within each other. And it's a continuum rather than a clear division. And hopefully sometime they'll, they'll um, uh, sort of, we'll get away from uh, there's one particular Borrelia uh, that's causing the problem. Uh, what is Lyme disease? Now, this is an interesting question because it again alludes to the fact that people want to deny its existence. In the UK uh, and Europe, uh, it's generally a considered to be uh, Aphzelia grinii, uh, many different uh, species of Borrelia, and also uh, carried by uh, many different ticks, so usually these, these uh, Ricinus and uh, Ixodes persocatus. Uh, in the USA, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, they define Lyme disease as specifically Borrelia burgdorferi up until 2017, and specifically carried by the Exodus scapularis tick. Um, probably because of pressure from uh, Mayo Clinic, they did include uh, the, the newly discovered American species of Mayonii, and they included that in 2017, uh, but nothing else is Lyme disease. Uh, since there are no uh, Ixodes uh, uh, scapularis ticks in south of the Mason-Dixon line, by definition, there can be no Lyme disease. And so uh, Dr. Masters, who was finding a, a Lyme-like disease in the south, uh, until the day he died, tried to get it named uh, Lyme disease and failed. Um, and uh, now it has the new name uh, 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 Starry. Southern tick relapsing illness, uh, Lyme disease, in other words. Um, in uh, Australia, there are again no Borrelia burgdorferi, there are no Ixodes scapularis ticks. Hence, officially, you, uh, Australian government and all the medical authorities say there's no Lyme whatsoever in, uh, in Australia. But Stewart found Borrelia species in 1982, and Maine in 2012 uh, found um, uh, Borrelia species in Aretha migrants, Russia. Uh, diagnosis. The uh, hurdles uh, that we have to overcome, or the patient has to overcome, is first of all a clinical diagnosis. Uh, that's the first hurdle. It can be good, but that's for a minority of people. If there's an EM rash that is definitive and recognized by a doctor, then they could get a, 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 an early diagnosis and early treatment and early cure. Um, however, that's, that's uh, infrequent. Um, my first diagnosis was stress. Uh, the this, this next hurdle that must be overcome is a, is a test. The doctors will normally send off a blood sample for testing and the first test will be an ELISA test. That's bad, um, it has low sensitivity. Uh, the second test uh, that's very frequently required is the, um, an immunoblot and that's uh, very bad because uh, it generates lots of false negatives. And for a de diagnosis of neuroborreliosis, you have to get over this last fence, which is a positive intrathecal cerebral spinal fluid test. Um, and uh, must demonstrate a higher level antibodies in the cerebral spinal fluid than in serum. Uh, this is just quickly um, uh, symptoms, uh, one person's experience. Uh, I've known him for 75 years. Um, and this is a table put together in an Excel spreadsheet in 2011. Um, it's been tidied up since. It was much rougher than this. Uh, general symptoms, uh, patient C, 
and uh, fatigue, dizziness, vertigo, low temperature, sweats, flu-like headache. Um, the Health Protection Agency in 2011 had uh, this as one of the general symptoms, uh, flu-like. Uh, NHS Choices had these. And I'd heard about chronic fatigue syndrome and ME and, um, and looked at some of the websites. And they were listing many more uh, symptoms uh, similar to mine. Dr. Ramsey published a book in 1985 uh, uh, regarding the outbreak of, in, of a disease, illness in the Royal Free Hospital amongst doctors, nurses, and patients. Um, and in, in his book, uh, digging around through it, uh, I found uh, uh, these uh, symptoms. I won't go into uh, much de detail now, but um, eyesight problems, floaters, temporary blindness, double, double vision, light sensitivity, hearing loss, tinnitus, um, gastrointestinal problems, uh, musculoskeletal neck, neck pain, knee pain, joint pain, muscle pain, pins and needles, peripheral neuropathies, insomnia, clumsy, balance problems, and so forth. And you'll see a lot of these appearing in the right-hand side columns here as well. And uh, cognitive problems. Uh, I have to uh, I have short-term uh, line memory, and so you'll see a lot of the back of my head because I can't remember what I've written. So I'm going to read the slides myself. And um, uh, but stammer, confusion, concentration, big problem is short-term memory loss, uh, mood swings, irritability, depression, thoughts of suicide. Um, these are all sort of classified by Ramsey as uh, emotional instability. Um, but if you go to a doctor and you mention that you have a, a few of these, or half a dozen even, or more, uh, then uh, there could be a good outcome. You could get a diagnosis of Lyme disease because it's representative of Lyme disease. Uh, however, it could be a bad outcome. Uh, for me, it was a diagnosis of stress, and for many people. Or uh, following this theme of good, bad, and ugly, uh, the ugly can be, it's all in your head, just get over it. And there's a tremendous number of patients that I've talked to. Um, I work with many advocacy groups and patients one-on-one, -on -one, and it's, just, it's, it, it, it's um, devastating to hear of the, uh, the treatment that they get. From not every doctor, there's a lot of fabulous doctors, but um, the, this uh, all-in-the-head problem is very commonly said. It is, uh, if you probably look, if you, if you look in the textbooks, you will probably see, say that uh, any patient that comes in with more than, and you know, describes more than six or five or six or more uh, symptoms, it's evidence of a somatic disorder, somatoform problem. Um, the key markers for Lyme borreliosis, diverse multisystemic symptoms, one, two, or more at any one time, they come and go, is relapsing remitting. Uh, other type of diseases, uh, there are more than 1,400 human pathogens. There's more than 120 species of Borrelia pathogenic infections. There's hundreds of viral infections, all tick-borne and, uh, and other diseases. Um, but let's get on to testing. What are the important parameters for testing? The first is sensitivity, the probability of a positive sample testing positive. Uh, the other uh, parameter, these are the only two important parameters, specificity, the probability that a negative sample will test negative. If that's not rocket science. Um, uh, as mentioned, um, I, with Professor Puri, published a paper on commercial test kits for the de detection of uh, Lyme borreliosis. Uh, independent studies... Um, focusing only on commercial test kits. And this is from the paper, it's the results. Uh, the ELISA test, uh, sensitivity 62%. The C6 test, which is the first stage test used by in the UK and uh, many other areas, um, about a 50% sensitivity. Uh, the 2TA test, about uh, 54%. And to be noted is that those independent uh, workers that, that evaluated these test kits, they were taking 100% positive Lyme disease cases. That is a case where there was an EM rash uh, and or culture positive and or already seropositive. Um, by stage, 
and his East Stage uh, an EM rash. Now, this means there was a record of an EM rash uh, in the records of the patients for whose samples they were testing. Uh, it was about uh, 47%. Um, but uh, where there was definitive early stage disease, uh, 35% sensitivity. And it, the sensitivity improved according to these workers until you, as you got up into the later stages. However, uh, there is no standard definition of early and late. Some workers defined early as being days to months. Some defined late as being months to years. Uh, the, uh, and almost none of the papers published use similar time frames. And with Lyme disease, it's, pr it's probably not a matter of time so much as, as a, a, a re response to the disease. Um, uh, insofar as uh, uh, if the brother in injected into your bloodstream, um, it's throughout your whole body, probably within minutes. And of course, the first thing the Borelli wants to do is exit the bloodstream in order to uh, evade the immune system. So burrow into cartilage, heart, brain, uh, cartilage for knees and chest pains. Um, the uh, Lee Flang and others published a paper at about the same time as this where they looked at all, st all uh, uh, in, uh, uh, independent studies, including research and modified tests, and of course included these commercial tests in that study. And they, they decided that all studies were deemed to have a high probability of sample selection. That is, the workers knew what the status was of the samples. Um, the seasick story, uh, I won't go into this too much, but uh, we have, um, that's the main one used, where the C6 test uh, is, is based upon a, a synthetic peptide, uh, not uh, native anti, uh, anti, antigens, and um, uh, it's 31% uh, sensitive, where the peptide was manufactured from uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, a Borrelia a subspecies IP190, it had a 24% sensitivity. So this is evidence that the test sensitivity will have different, this single C6 test will have different sensitivity for different tests. This is the, uh, uh, the lack of improvement in tests over time. This is from 96 to 2016. These are the independent work research. There's a 0.1% improvement of sensitivity, which is in the noise range per year. Uh, the two-tier test, uh, that's now required by the US uh, guidelines for diagnosis of Lyme disease in the UK. Uh, this is from the paper on the Bayesian analysis. I won't go into the details here, it's in the paper. It's showing the difference between false negatives for Lyme testing and HIV testing. And there's that number, worst case, anything up to more than 500 times more false negatives. Um, uh, this is where people have tried to improve or modify. They've switched around the C6 or the immunoblot and the ELISA um, to no real uh, avail. Uh, so uh, 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 a, West, a whole cell ELISA followed by C6, 38%. The C6 preceding it drops it down. Uh, here's a case uh, where they switch them around the C6 second to the C6 first, and it drops from 50 to 40%. Um, the problem, of course, is the antigen source for these test kits. The, uh, the ones they use in the UK, it's a French source. Um, the IR6 uh, region I've mentioned, uh, what is a sensitive of different species. Uh, there are many pathogenic species, Miyamotoi, Valesiana, and the, uh, it, it, we, they need to be able to detect these, uh, not only for treatment of patients, but also recognition of the disease burden. Uh, some pre-analytical problems, laboratory testing problems. Uh, a big one could be the sample shipping and storage. The test kit manufacturers say that a test, a, sam a sample of blood has to be tested within five days of draw, blood draw, and it needs to be maintained uh, refrigerated over that time. I've seen records where the date of the blood draw is given and the date of report is given. I've almost never seen the date of the test itself. And sometimes there's a big, many, many weeks between the blood draw and the report. Um, this is uh, from, um, this, is the real, this is the ugly. This is uh, within laboratory errors. It's an example from, a, from a, an actual Lyme reference laboratory 
the use of inappropriate and unvalidated tests. They used a serum test for cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, process modifications, incubation time changed from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, that should have improved the sensitivity. In fact, the band, the Western block bands were, the control bands were very weak. So maybe serum dilution or, or uh, reagent dilution changed. Uh, calibration, Western block reading is uh, quite difficult. Calibration and recording charts were thrown away and they used eyeballs just to look at the uh, tests. Um, modified interpretation, equivocals, negative, and uh, very frequently uh, positives are now called negative. And uh, quality control failures, smeared stain strips not rejected, and so forth. Uh, testing, who doesn't want uh, accurate tests? Well, the people that uh, currently have the patents and royalties and income from the current tests uh, certainly don't want anything new. Uh, this is an interesting thing I put together the other day, uh, T-cell assays. In 1988, Duttweiler and others, a major figure in the Lyme world, said that uh, seronegative patients were testing positive for the T-cell assay. Uh, the T-cell assay in 1991, Steer said it was helpful in seronegative cases. And in uh, 88, he said the T-cell assay was useful for monitoring antibiotic treatment response. Um, Liza Batman, a Nobel uh, nominee, uh, developed a test. Uh, that was uh, the laboratory that was using, was forced to close down too many false positives, too many false positives or too many positives. Uh, um, the Ellis Spot, a Swedish group uh, have used Ellis Spot for a decade or more uh, for research, but in 2012 they published a paper, must not be used for clinical use, diagnosis of human beings. Uh, the U.S. Uh, National Institute of, uh, of Standards and Technology. I worked with them in the 1980s. They're fundamental scientists. They go back to the basics, and we were working to develop a metrology standard for the semiconductor industry. Uh, they uh, were asked to work with the university to come up with a test. Um, they did so successfully. The last I heard, it had been mothballed. It is not in use. Uh, every year, uh, Laboratory X is said to find too many positive. Everyone's positive. That's a total false statement. They don't find everybody positive. But and also, they're not getting uh, random samples off the street. They're getting samples from doctors, some of whom are very good at, at uh, identifying Lyme disease. And in fact, uh, the numbers that I'm currently generating in my computer models for Lyme disease, it is far more prevalent than, uh, than uh, expected. Uh, Willie Bortoffer said, uh, uh, the controversy in Lyme disease research is a shameful affair, and I say that because the whole thing is politically tainted. Money goes to people who have, for the past 30 years, produced the same thing. Nothing. Uh, the future of tests, uh, sero serology testing, well, the, um, uh, inflammatory markers, early spot. Um, uh, this is an old technology, fluorescence in situ hybridization, LTT. Um, multiplex allies are looking at uh, multiple species of Borrelia, multiple pathogens. Um, obviously, there's a lot of talk about next generation sequencing. This, this, is, a, this is a technology, uh, PCR enhanced electrospay ionization mass spectrometry. Um, Port and Down had such a piece of equipment, second generation equipment of this type. Um, uh, it was a failure, uh, and the manufacturers went back to the original development team that, uh, that invented the system. And uh, that system now is widely used in the biodefense uh, areas and in research laboratories. The Molditoff is another time of flight mass spectrometry method. And then uh, what's called next gen, which is current gen, uh, Oxford nanopore, uh, ion torrent, and so forth. It's not a comprehensive list, it's some examples. Uh, how to make a, 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 a disease disappear. Uh, the, the European Union Commission uh, implemented a decision in 2018. They said that, uh, that a group of uh, communicable diseases and health issues must be covered by ep epidemiological surveillance by all the, all the countries of the EU. This is paragraph one from that. It says they have decided uh, and established a list of communicable diseases that will be covered. That was Jean-Claude Juncker in 2018. And let's see what in, what's in the list of those, uh, those uh, diseases. There's 57 diseases that they want to be monitored. Uh, anthrax, botulism, it goes on, influenza, influenza, H5N1, Legionnaire's disease, leptospirosis, hysteria, Lyme neurobiliosis, malaria, measles, mumps, Zika virus disease, congenital Zika virus disease. But where's Lyme disease? They've made it disappear. It's not there. Um, 
what's it going to take to get a diagnosis of neuroborreliosis? Well, as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, supporting evidence is clinical and a positive test, uh, but necessary evidence is uh, cerebral spinal fluid plesiotosis, uh, elevated white blood cells, or this intrathecal test. And just to quickly show you what that is, this is a spreadsheet that uh, comes out of a, uh, a, a computer. Uh, it, it's a from Viramed, um, blood chemistry looking at cerebral spinal fluid, IgG concentrations, IgM, IgA, is multiplied up. That gives a synthesis of those uh, uh, antigens. Uh, they do the same for the serum. And then the computer calculates whether the, after different dilutions, uh, then it calculates whether the, uh, here's a 20% line, and it'll put a dot on this graph with the IgG and albumin levels. And if it's above the 20% line, that's a positive uh, 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 test. And if it's below it, negative. The test has never, ever been validated. Its sensitivity is unknown. Uh, obtaining cerebral spinal fluid samples is invasive, not without risk. I know personally three people that have had the test. All three went into A&E quite quickly after that. Uh, the methodology is complex for a busy cost control laboratory, and there's a history of taking shortcuts. The impact uh, uh, of uh, it's widely regarded now as a zoonosis of epidemic proportion is not going to be recorded in Europe, not at all. Uh, Neuroborreliosis will be under recorded because of this invasive test and also unknown sensitivity is a major problem. Uh, so, conclusions uh, Borrelia travels in company many, many co-infections, uh, and published data that I've seen uh, says that for every person with a earlier infection, 90% uh, of them have a co-infection, at least one co-infection, and sometimes many more. The persistiform, it's refractory, multisystemic multitude of symptoms. Testing, commercial tips have low sensitivity, unknown sensitivity for many species. Two-tier test is useless, and um, quality management is very key, very critical. ISO 15189 accreditation is very key. So that's, uh, that's it, thank you. Right, uh, thanks Michael. It's, it's not really a question, it's, it's more or less a comment. Uh, in terms of calculating sensitivity and specificity, uh, what we normally do, we compare our lab test to a gold standard. Um, however, in the reality, there's in the, in the world of Lyme, there's no gold standard. And then we ended up come up with a positive rate. See, there's 100 clinically confirmed patients. Um, 60 of them showed positive to the lab test. So uh, we come up with a positive rate. Um, I personally tend not to use sensitivity because it's, it's really, strictly speaking, sensitivity, you need to compare to a gold standard. How good is your test in terms of performance to a gold standard? Is. One of the difficulties, these, uh, these, uh, these serology tests are looking for an immune response. And so if you take a group, as I say, the, 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 the paper that I published is only from from studies which where, where, the, where the patient had an EM rash or culture mm. or already seropositive or all of those. So the CDC requires all of those conditions. And when, when you're looking at that, the tests still don't perform. Um, obviously, if you have people that are immunosuppre immune suppressed, have already been treated with antibiotics or have uh, had steroids or, or just in, intrinsically are not, not fighting the disease, uh, serology tests won't, won't uh, find it. Yeah. And that's why people are looking at a non-serology test and looking for some of these PCR type tests. Great. Thanks. Um, there, are, there are many people here. I'm uh, Alain Troutman, the immunologist in Paris. And there are many people uh, wondering uh, when somebody is, is sick with the Lyme disease, what is the probability that it, it, uh, the test will be positive? And my personal answer is I, I don't know. Because amongst all the figures that are given, for instance, at some point you say you, you've uh, put forward the, the number of 60% on average. But 60% in this case 
uh, includes all the stages. And we know that f for the first month after the, 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 the bites, there will be no antibodies. So mm -hmm. it's just meaningless to measure yeah. for the first month. So it's, it should be removed from the, from the average. Nevertheless, your paper is often quoted with this number. I don't say that it's your responsibility of 60% sensitivity, which I think is wrong. Now, neuroborea, in the case of a uh, uh, central uh, problem, uh, the, the number climbs at 95% in your, in your figures. But again, I don't think that's uh, really true because uh, it's not a criticism of your work. Huh? It's a, you, you made a meta-analysis. But it's the way the groups are constituted. So if you decide that it will, uh, the people with neuroborreliosis will only be those which have, who have uh, EM rash and uh, maybe a CS, positive CSF, of course, they will have uh, uh, antibodies in the, in the serum. So the way the group have, are, con are constituted, uh, I've never seen something convincing. So at the present time, I don't know what is the percentage of people who are sick and which are uh, seropositive. No, that's, uh, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the, uh, uh, the NICE guidelines and most medical authorities say, do not test for an EM rash. An EM rash is diagnostic. Do not test for it. And the reason they say that is not because they, because they want to save money. It's because the test is going to be negative, almost certainly in the very early stages. And, it's, and, tr it, and the Lyme disease is very treatable in the early stages. So we miss an opportunity. Unless somebody's recognized uh, an EM rash and the doctor agrees that it's an EM rash and starts treating it immediately, people get into this condition that I'm in, which is a chronic disease. And uh, yes, all I'm reporting, uh, the, uh, obviously the, uh, the work that I did there was quite a long time ago and it was in, in response to the, um, the Public Health England, uh, at that time Health Protection Agency, they said the tests were 99% accurate. And so obviously I, uh, I wanted to knock that down. And so even, even, uh, even with uh, best case 100% positive samples, these tests are still not performing, and I totally agree with you. They are worse than that. And for the sp other species, the common species in the UK is uh, Gorinii and Valesiana. There is no test data available for the sensitivity of Valesiana. Uh, there's almost no data that I know of uh, for Miyamotoi, and that's in Ireland here as well as in the UK. So yes, and doctors are so reliant on testing we have to have super testing because a doctor will send off for, for a diabetes test or whatever. The result he gets back, he's going to believe. Uh, and and the, the, they're going to believe these test results. Which And even now, some positive results are being discounted, especially IgG response. IgG sometimes is considered as as a past infection, not current infection. That is nonsense. The, the entire, the entire um, uh, IgM rising and falling and IgG rising later and falling, uh, I have data, I haven't presented it here, but uh, there's data that says that is just totally incorrect. It's, it's a stylized, classical textbook uh, scenario. It does not happen. The immune response comes up and down uh, and so forth. Uh, I I agree absolutely with you that there are several points that I think it's, uh, that you have shown to us uh, should be improved in the, in the future. I think uh, one, I'm, of I'm, them, I'm, one of I'm, them, one of them. I've got Lyme deafness, so maybe I no, can come. No, I, I just thought that absolutely there are several points that you have presented now that we have to do, um, we have to improve in the future. One of them that I think also very, very important is the sampling. How we are going to choose the samples for research, uh, different research uh, uh, goal. Uh, for example, when we want to, to determine uh, that uh, is an uh, additional antibiotic therapy useful or not, we can choose 200 patients who has all Lyme disease, who were all serologically confirmed, who were 
already treated for, for one month of antibiotic therapy. But if, and this is what happened, if the time between the primary infection and the, the therapy, first and second therapy, is not the same, you are not going to get results which can be uh, really interpreted in a, in a, in a um, uh, correct way because we cannot treat in the same way a patient who had Lyme disease, uh, the primary infection, one month ago or one year ago or 10 years ago. And I think this is what in the future we should do again because it is on this kind of research that uh, the conclusion that we have to, everybody have to follow because it is in the guidelines, one month antibiotic, that's all. And the patients are, are, have no more Lyme disease and this is not correct. This is why I think it's really important to try to improve all these points uh, that uh, you mentioned uh, in this presentation. We have a lot of things to do in the future. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly the, the, um, the, 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 the argument that it's a past infection, it's, it's a persistent disease. It, it's, it's still in my body. It's coming out. It's leaking out. The round body forms are converting to active forms. Um, and if my immune system's working, I don't feel too bad. If it's not working, I feel worse. If I'm on treatment, I feel better. If I'm not on treatment, I feel worse. And, um, uh, and there'll be trillions of their own body forms in my body. They can leak out, they can reactivate uh, 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 on a continuing basis. And if your immune system knocks them out, fine. But if you have a bit of stress, a bit of uh, aggravation, then bingo, you, you're feeling really sick again. And, uh, and a ten, it, it, it's a 10, it's a 20, it's a 30, it's a 40-year-old disease. It may, it, with, current tech, with current treatment, it, 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 I, it is treatable. It is treatable with current treatment. But that's the best I can say. And it requires, for most people, long-term, ongoing, continually fighting 